Okay, any for your thoughts? There's a lot of times where you're sailing along just fine, and you come into some waves, and or the boat slows down for whatever reason, and there's a few things like checklists that I go through, or that I think most people go through. Um, maybe Chris can answer this question. Uh, like when you start to feel slow, what, what's the first thing that you do? Use the jib. Use the jib. Mm -hmm. Are you playing the jib a lot through the, the, no. the entire day? No. No, but as soon as we go slow, we use yeah. the jib. And like in the last race, we had a great start. We started sliding down on everybody, and you think that, oh, well, if you're sliding down, you should pull the jib in. We yeah. used the, the jib, I swear, a quarter inch, and all of a sudden we start pulling back yeah. up on, yeah. on people. Yeah. We, we, didn't, we didn't like that at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, 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 uh, are they one to one or two to one? One to one. One to one, so a quarter inch. Um, so the jib is very, the boat's pretty front loaded, pretty round jib. Um, and when you ease it, it helps the boat climb up, right? When you pull it in, it brings the bow down more. So that's a really good thing. We play the jib kind of a lot, and I know I like to play the jib a lot, um, just to keep the boat going, you know? And I think as soon as we would slow down, you know, or we, we I, you know, you kind of use belt and suspenders, you can feel the boat, especially if you've sailed a lot, and then you can use your speedo as like two different checks. And if we feel like we're going slow, I think it's really important to put the bow down, ease the jib, maybe ease the main too, and count to like five or 10, depending on the condition. and. Let the keel get hooked up again, let the sails get hooked up again, and then you can kind of squeeze her back up. I don't know, Rod, do y'all do anything different? Yeah, you, well, actually, the first thing is that we never clean the jib, right? So it's, it's active sheet constantly. Yeah. So, uh, wow. and we do a two to one and, and, you know, on the three months, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I like the two to actually, one. Actually, I asked Rogi for a self tailor, he's thinking about it. Rob <laughs> 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 Kutch. So, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. And we, we do that thing. There is one, especially with the north jib, if you look down, um, it, it has a fairly long leech. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, even though you go block to block, it still is open, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a fake open. So you need to make sure that even if the delta starts flying, to your point, if you feel a little choke that the oxygen mass start coming down, you gotta give a give a touch. And yeah, we do. We don't we don't count to ten, but we I count mentally a little bit to you know three, four, and just uh, press again and reset. So uh, the the delta today I think was high enough that will require you to sell two different boats on every single tack. So you, you go into your low boat and then your high wind mode because you have like a six to 12 and sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so mm -hmm. two different settings that may happen, you know, every 10, 15 seconds or so. Wow. So are y'all ever moving the jib leads, the three of you? Yeah. Or... We, uh, we moved once, that was it. You do move them though. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever move them? Hardly ever. It's got to be blown like 18. We never move them forward. Yeah. We, we will move them out yeah. if it's blown over. So, do you ever move them? So, we have three spots. You have three spots, okay. So, we've got a forward spot, which is if you if you have quantums, I think if you have doors, you can do this as well, right? With the block, you fold it over. You have like, I, I like to do, I fold the block outboard when I'm sitting at the dock. I take a line down the middle of the block, the jib car block. And it should go right across the chain plates. Yeah. And then I come back one from there. Oh. And that's my that's my gotcha. spot. And if I feel like I'm always choking or we're, you know, when I go to trim yeah. in and it just closes off, I might come back one for there. So those are my that's kind of how I line it up. It, it seems to work for us. The biggest thing I will say, Chris, to your point, I haven't sailed the boat in a while and the ease is allowing us to go higher. So on the quantums, we have a little bit higher clue, so we can't really bang it into the block like you do on the north. So I'm out like that much from block to the clue ring, right? And that seems to be a good spot, and as soon as the boat gets slow, we ease an inch from that, mm -hmm. and then we start to bring it back in. But we're watching the speedo as well, and, and kind of mentally taking that time check of how long, how fast it takes to get up the speed here. Whoa. Yeah. Here's a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if a lot of us have speedos now, the speed puck or whatever, what are the speeds you're seeing? Well, just to go back to the leads for a hot second, yep. we line our jib blocks up the center of the ships. We look from the dock or on the side of the boat from the uppers. You line up the uppers like you're using a line sight, and we want the center of the blocks right in, the, in, the, in that yep. line. And then, as far as I'm concerned, you can bolt them there and never move them again. <laughs> I mean, and I think Mike Marshall, other board champions uh, that I've 
sailed with and talked with a lot would kind of say the same thing. They just be very active on the sheet. Every time I've tried to move it, the boat gets unbalanced, right? But, but that has so much to do with the balance of the boat. Like Chris was saying, it just never really works for us. So I always leave them there um, in every condition, which is kind of wild, but it doesn't seem to work any other way for us. Um, so the speeds you were talking about, we were looking, I don't know if Willem's here, he's staring at that thing all the he's time. We were anywhere him. between, I think, 5.4 to 5.7, somewhere in there. Yeah. I mean, it was really light at the beginning of the day and when you're at the end. But The last two races, kind of 5.5 five on starboard and 5.7 to 5.8 on board. You got a paddle wheel, right? Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're going to be two touch yeah. <laughs> gotcha. okay. How about you? Well, Travis, where were you up wind there? 5.3 five, five, the whole night? Uh, slow, slow high mode was 5.2, fast mode was so we talked a little bit about when the boat slows down. Uh, that's a speed thing. Maybe we talk about a boat handling. Uh, you want to ask if you want to take it from next? Want to talk about boat handling? Boat handling? <laughs> Maybe sets? Yeah, so. I mean, do you want to talk about bow handling upwind? Do you want to talk about sets? You choose. It's up to you. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll continue with the, the theme of like how to keep the boat going. I think today was pretty okay. tough. Uh, it felt like today that eventually you would stop and you'd have to get the boat going again. And what are the three things that I'm looking for in that? One of them we already talked about. Got to ease the jib out just a little bit. Try to get the bow down rumbling a little bit. The other thing is... Um, you know, I have my checks, but the first thing that I put on when a puff hits me is my back stays. And then if the back stays not working 100%, then I try to go to my traveler. And then from there, it's main sheet. Today, not much of a main sheet these day. It was more traveler or back stay. Um, so those are kind of the three checks. Like when you're going, if, if you start getting slow and you have a lot of back stay on, you have a lot of bang on and all that stuff, you got to ease all that stuff off. Kind of get the boat to lock underneath your butt. You can start to heal a little bit. Ease the sails. Get going again. Start pulling everything on again as, as you get up to speed. Um, as far as boat handling goes, I think Willem would be a really good uh, tacking part of this. At some point, we want to ask you that question. But mark roundings, we can go into that. Sure. Mark roundings. The biggest thing I think in mark roundings, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong is pre-feeding that guy between the weather and offset. Mm -hmm. You gotta get the guy outside the sta uh, the, the, the four or the, 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 the shroud. Shroud. Yeah, yeah, shroud. Yeah, yeah, shroud. Yeah. You gotta get them outside the shroud. If they do not go outside the shroud, you pull the sail up, they're gonna be wrapped at the clues like this. So just make sure that's the biggest thing and then uh, that, I mean that that's one of the things I look at. Absolutely, and I think also well, okay, go ahead. well, I think also the way you tie the knot onto the clue can make a big difference on that. If we just go through, if the kite's flying, let's say the, the, the sheets go through the grommet and we tie a knot, it ain't knot or a stopper knot, because that allows it to travel along across the head stay or the side stay smoothly. Has anybody been trying to pull a kite around and it grabs a head stay or something and you're like, oh, you're oh, oh. that's because you're not skiding correctly, right? So try to figure out a way. We just go through and tie a big knot so that it's smooth transition on all those things. If you're trying to sneak it around the side stay and you got one of those bad knots, it's, it can end poorly sometimes. So just when you when you do the knots and you try to go through himself again, you want to have the knots facing outboard of the kite, right? So that the inside of the kite when it's going around the four stand, there's nothing going on. That's kind of what we're talking about when you do A little bit on boat speed handling, though, but for these guys, because I think Chris and, and you guys are probably the fastest upwind, in my opinion. Um, so you don't go right, yeah. That's why I have to tack on them so much because they'll catch me. So you want to talk about what you guys do up wind? What are the what are the sequence of events to get the boat going and keep it? Well, um, good news is that uh, David and Prague they they sell a lot of dinghies. So and, and we we do a lot of that also on the downwind. They make sure that the boat behaves a little bit like that. Like a dinghy, just counting the momentum that we have to recover when we have to do the countdown. So, in terms of the one thing that we do as much as we can is trying to keep the boat as flat as possible. There was a lot of talk on the on the uh, years ago was in Corpus because it was pretty windy that uh, is the boat really really likes to be to be flat. Just just that that fake pressure on the rudder that you have even in, in today's in the in the morning today. You, you gotta get rid of that. All that is energy that you're going 
pushing the transom a little sideways, right? Because the board is healed. As soon as you get rid of that stuff and make sure that you have weight forward, the boat really, really likes it. That's how we find an hour boat that, that the boat likes to do it. Um, and then, you know, make sure that uh, on the coming out of the roll tags that happen early, early in the day, um, they, you gotta be careful on, as you're coming out, and are we gonna say a squish or squash? And like when you press down on the weather, squish. Squash. 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 squish out. out of. Remember, as you're doing that, you're moving the parent wheel up for like two seconds. When that happens, instead of you trimming it, you gotta lay it out and touch as, as, as you're pressing. Let the ball accelerate, and then as the ball goes on, just trim back in. So it's a little bit counter to it, right? Uh, so, but as you're walking out, make sure that you're not like sitting hard and pressing. It's just because all that apparent wind is coming back, it's going up, and then it's going to move forward. Yeah. So that was the, the main thing that we were doing, uh, you know, and uh, Brody is a fantastic driver, and a couple of thin lanes there, the main thing was keeping the boat flat. You think you're not going to survive, but if you keep it flat and make that kill work, yeah. it's going gonna to get you up. Mm -hmm. Chris? Speed tricks? Uh, speed tricks. Uh, on Fort Tech, in the last race, Going into the, even if you had your back stay off because you were in a light spot, before you get to the set of three ways, put the back stay in. It keeps the, it keeps the rig from, and the head stay, you know, if you go through the, the ways, the head stay goes like this, and the rig pumps a lot. Right. If you, you, the boat is a lot more stable if you put just on the, you know, three feet of back stay, which is kind of a lot, but it, it, it seems to keep everything stable. Um, then you I release think, it after you get through yeah, the waves? Yeah, as soon as you through the waves, you pull right off. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that's kind of a, that worked for us pretty well. Uh, the other thing that, that, like, today was kind of transitioning between just keeping the traveler in the middle for us and having it up, like in the, in the last couple races, having it up maybe six inches. And we really like having it up six inches and having just a little twist in the leech when you got that long. Yeah. It seems to, I don't know, push the boat forward a little bit better. Yeah. Chris makes a really good point, you know, in just about every boat, if you see your head stay moving around a lot, that's never good. You always want it to be fairly stable, right? So if it's moving around a lot, either your rig's too soft, but you can't adjust that in the race, right? So you get around it by sneaking the back stay on just enough so that your head stay and that entry to the gym is stable and not swinging around. Because like what Rod was talking about, and out of attack, the mast swings through the air, right? So the apparent wind shifts to where the direction of the mast is swinging. Just like if the head stays moving around, it's changing the entry angle of the wind all the time because the head stays swinging around. So trying to have like a stable and consistent really helps the airflow stay stuck to the sail, sail right? It makes it easier to sail the boat. Um, are there any questions out there? Yeah. How Ask much, a question, get a hat. <laughs> cool. Uh, <laughs> how, much, how much talking is there on the boat? We actually, it's a, that's a really good question. We, we actually kind of relearned that today in the last race that uh, the more we talked and communicated, the better we went. Mm -hmm. You know, and on a day like today where it was puffy, I'm, I'm calling the breeze and I'm constantly calling the puffs and then the lulls are obviously even more important sometimes, you know? So before the race starts, before the whole day starts, I think it's really important to stand up, get to try to stand on the cabin top, look up wind for a really long time and get a feel for how fast the puffs are traveling and that helps dial it in. And then ask the trimmers, like, hey, was I close there? Or was I on or was I off? You're like, oh, you're a little behind. Okay, well then, you know, then I call it a little bit slower. So the, the communication's going on all the time about the pressure coming. And then I think, you know, Willem and uh, Glenn have a great communication loop as well between him easing the jib or trimming the jib or, the, or pulling the backstay on or things like that. There's probably yeah. never four seconds that no one's yeah. talked. Yeah. Three yeah. seconds, maybe. Yeah, we're talking all the time. The yeah. biggest thing, like, we, we talked today about this. We didn't talk enough. And, you know, Ian said something, and I said something. <laughs> and there's one of the things as a driver that I like to hear from the tactician is just have a conversation here. out loud about what you're thinking about because if you're if, if you're a driver who kind of goes by what the tactician wants to do like i am then i just need to know that we're heading in the right direction we this is what's coming up it gives me time to react to whatever's going to come to me 
so that I'm not late ducking or, mm -hmm. hey, we're coming up to a pack of boats. We never even talked about this. Do we want to do we want to continue this way or do we want to lead them back? Like that, all that conversation should just constantly be happening. And then the trimmer and the driver are constantly talking about relatives with other boats. So, you know, one of the things I'll ask Ian, how are we going? You know, are we higher, same, higher, faster, lower, slower? <laughs> Don't want to ever hear that. I will lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have to hear it. I have to hear it. You know. So you're a trimmer and your driver <laughs> bites at you because you say that. Just take it. You got to <laughs> so, tell me. Um, so I guess the one variant I see a lot downwind is everyone's pull height. Like, what do you guys do for on your pull height like downwind? That is also a really good, good question. question. We, yeah. we messed with that. You know, normally we, this is kind of a Willem question, um, but normally we try to keep the, the clues fairly even. And today we noticed, it was like, let's just try it. Let's pull the pull up a little bit more and see if both clues go up. And I think they kind of did, you know? And if that's the case, then I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, so it's, it's probably yeah. a little bit higher the than perpendicular to the back. And the so, you know, so like trying to get the clues even most of the time. And if it's the pulse below perpendicular to the mass, you're losing the mass projection away from the mainsail. And therefore, try cheating it up and see if the whole kite raises with you. And if that happens, that's usually a good thing. And if the topping are set or slack, either the full topping that these go up or the bowling going to have back. Okay. It's probably like a boat speed oh. over 5.6, put the pole a little higher, 5.7. Okay. Probably something. So to follow that up, downwind, we kind of had a, we had a low mode where we wanted to sail more dead downwind and more like half sailing. But we always had people wanting to challenge us take our lanes attacking from behind. And it, as you went down that leg, it had a tendency to get a little lighter. So they're bringing the pressure with them. So they're attacking from behind when you're trying to defend a lead. How do, you, how do you play that game well? I mean, Travis, you took you took eight boat lengths, ten boat lengths out of us one time, and yeah. you were playing the high road. Yeah, so the biggest thing today, in my opinion, even upwind, the edges won. So so being on the edges was, was big. The pressure would build, come from the edges, right? So, so Chris, you, you back me up on this, right? We would do that quick jive around the mark, and you just try to get to the furthest edge of the boats that may, might have been ahead of you, because you're going to yeah, get the pressure yeah, first, you get kind of that loser breeze you get. And the biggest thing about that is that when you're in the middle of the course and all of a sudden, especially going downwind, uh, when you go <laughs> downwind and you're inside all the boats on the outside, the wind is going to them up and over. over. So it's getting lighter in the middle of the course, yeah. especially on a day like today where I truly believe the edge is pain. So you want to kind of stay on the edge. You don't have to sail high or anything, but initially you need to get yeah. you boogied over. And then you got it. And then you got it. Right? So that, that's my theory about the edges today, and I, I think that's why you see a little more pressure than people think of. Chris, you say something like that? Uh, Paul, how are you? You were just talking. That was the other thing. Sitting on the other side. I kind of like to have it. I know. I know. Mr. Cousin. Yeah. 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 Uh, the North Shoe, uh, a good sort of easy thing to look at is the center seam of the spinnaker being parallel to the mast. The, the Greg Fisher, I think, yeah. maybe still be in the footing guy. Right. As long as the center seam of the spinnaker is parallel with the mast, you're probably in the mast. Oh, wow. Okay. Real quick, uh, about 20 and about 12, we need to report to that guy. Pro tip. More Ooh. questions. We got hats and cuffs to um, give away here. So, Rod, going back to the, the question or the topic about uh, you know sailing in clean air. In that first race, I noticed y'all sailing really nice and kind of down the center, pretty deep. How do you feel that work? So, once again. Yeah, that's a good question. Is that? Yeah, the DPS kite is a machine. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Get out of there, Good job, Dre Heim. You like it? You know, that's called recycling, baby. Yeah. <laughs> we do mean it. So, essentially, again, uh, uh, Froggy is, is very comfortable. That is doing a great job of keeping the boat heel to weather. So we do not sail the boat flat until, until you know, we're falling off the cliff in terms of lighting. Mm -hmm. It's getting too light. Then, then we start getting a little flatter trying to help the gravity get this boat going. But we do a lot of projection and keeping the boat heel to weather constantly. 
you don't have to overdo it until you're fighting the the rudder, but just enough to keep if you're gonna make an error air on the side of too much heel to weather rather than less. Mm. That help us stay low, low, low and you know, just again just support the sheets and just a little bit of heel and you know every time you get pressure, uh, just trying to slowly drive it down. You know? Uh, and as soon as I, and the communication to your point, the talk, as soon as I, I, I would tell Brogy, that's the bottom, that's it, that's our code for, hey, watch it. And he just comes up just enough until you see the spinnaker kind of up, just growing again. So there was a lot of that, especially as you were crossing the middle. Because at a given point, you have to cross, right, right, so uh, coming from the edge. So uh, that, that was essentially it, just the, the boat responds quite well. To dingy style settings, whoever does laser stuff does right. So, there's a guy in the back with the pit vipers on. Yes. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious to know, like, uh, we were focusing our speed downwind with the base, but we like, 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 Hitting, hitting uh, the rollers down, so we came right back up. So we were hitting we were a lot hotter than most boats. And we find we were collapsing in quite a lot. And, uh, we took there we was took one hot race. Hot I, there was one race that I mentioned. I don't know if it was the first or the second. I mentioned to uh, Dave, you know, our boat to, I think it was about, about 30. 30. About 30 went way right. Yeah, my, On the yeah. downwind, they went right. Yeah, you went that's, right and that's went not us. right down. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. And then when they jive, I ask him, Presley, <laughs> let's see how they, this cat pans out for them. Because they were coming at a really hot angle, and the wind was going lighter. Yeah. And, uh, and it's still going more right. So it was a very twitching to the finish. And I think, to your point, it didn't actually pay yeah, off. Yeah, I'll be yeah, careful, yeah. though. Yeah. If you got pressure, you know, the cat is going to tell you later he's losing pressure on the base. So, uh, you know, you, you get things loaded, just carry on. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a current thing happening since I've already had two it has many variables right because that that conversation can extend a lot and it has to do with number one if it's the first or the second the first or the yeah, like, it? which means uh, uh, the, the cone of death as the attackers are getting into the run. Uh, everybody, everybody still together, especially on a day like today, was, you know, everybody was fairly make it easy, you know, fairly quick, right? So you got to make the call early on to say, well, can I keep surfing and extend or sacrifice because the, you know, the variety of the course is going to be so good that we're going to ride in early jives, which we did early jives almost the whole day today, right? So it paid off. So, just to your point, the, the wave will help, but about it. that's some currency. You just need to know what you buy for that currency. You see if the angle and the rest of the fleet are going to benefit you or not just by carrying on, just getting the wave. Does that make sense? Yeah, just the specific, the, the specific weight of that. we got one more question right here. Yeah, yeah it's mostly related to... Oh. Well, we'll do two questions. Right. <laughs> you want to hear my question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or to maintain speed for those mm -hmm. I would say the biggest thing is probably putting the bow down a little bit. You know? yeah. And then easing the sails if it's a really big lull or if it's a really big wave set. Um, what would y'all say? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is. Uh, the biggest thing is you also got to remember when you're pressing, it's not a foot, it's, a, it's just feeling the jig even more, like having straight telltales. Don't let those outside telltales go. That's that's enough of a press to go through it and then you can just take it away. Otherwise, you're going to lose. You try to go straight through the Yeah. We'll try to drive. When we see those circumstances happening, we see the show.
You guys mentioned block to block with North Sales yeah, on the jibs. Okay. Are you talking like block to block, like laser block to block? So it depends. Because to me, it looks completely stretched if you do that. It, it depends. So if, do, you, do you have blocks sewn into your coop? No. Web, web dog? Uh, no. Do you have two to one jib sheets? No. So we are like not going to get block to block. Okay. Like, all on. right. That's, so so uh, what, happened, yeah, what, what would happen is if you just have a, a grommet in the, in the coop, and like no, no blocks, and you attach blocks to it yourself, like with uh, those Harkin loops yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. two, two not twenty-nine or forty. Yeah, meters, so it, then that might get block to block. But also, yeah, if the yeah. if the rings web down to the sail, you also don't. We yeah. don't normally get block to block. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. How close do you is your yeah. uh, yeah. Oh. how close is the top of your jib to like to the bow? The arc tack is where the tack hole is. I, I tried yeah. to move it half one time and I told him I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is like, another hole behind it, but I don't think <laughs> so. There, we just have a pelican <laughs> blade mill okay. snap tackle, and that's where it is. Oh. I, I, I will say this because I say this about all these debriefs. I don't change my tune to base at the end of the day. So I am set up exactly as I am in the last race. You guys can walk all over my boat with clean feet if you want. <laughs> for anything you want, put your tuning gauges on, uh, you know, t take your tape measures and you can figure out exactly where everything is. That's more power to you. Take pictures with your phones. Yep. Happy to have you do that. And bow 17. Bow uh, <laughs> 17. To, to okay. end Party's that, on. I'd love to hear from these two guys just what the, two, the biggest takeaway for you felt was from today. Like what, what did you learn today? What did you think it was most important to focus on? Something like that. Uh, it took us a long time to get back into it. We went, like our team, not only hasn't sailed together, we haven't sailed at all in a race since March. And yeah. we went out last night at 5 o'clock to sail a little bit. Yeah. And, and no, like, clearly we, we needed some more shaking off the bus. So it, it practice, like people don't practice enough. Well, like people should really get out and practice. Tiller time's important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, four. Right on. I mean, we haven't sailed. We did one regatta at home, and, uh, and that was it. Let's wrap up the. I mean, probably actually packed the boat. We need to start the help. <laughs> yeah. I was busy. I know, Dave, you dropped brought the rig down, but I was busy. <laughs> but, uh, no, but yeah, theater time. I, I think is just getting used to it, and it's the, the change in gear. We knew the last one. I, I know we went right. It didn't pay off. Many boats went right and realized that it was it was the wrong place to be. But also at that point, you start seeing like everything is a little wrong, right? And uh, and it's the reaction time that theater time that you're talking uh, about get closer to that gap. Like you identify what's wrong, go ahead and fix it, and cut your loss, right? So I think it took us a little longer. It's just you know the time, ten thousand hours, right? Yeah. Ten thousand hours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's okay to say don't don't feel, don't hesitate to ask any of us any questions or anything like that throughout the week. We're always here to help. Thank you. Um, and some of them came into Spanish, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I might understand them better. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>